G'day, hi, and welcome. If I fog up on you, it's because uh, my phone just came out of the basement. <laughs> but it doesn't matter because the, the camera angle is going to be pretty lousy anyway, so we just have to kind of make do with that. Uh, maybe I can find a better camera angle for you guys. Hang on one second. Uh, it is jam night, so that's a good thing. Uh, yeah, I'm going to put my camera here. So you guys get to see it. Hopefully my phone just doesn't go flying. That's the that's the big one. As long as the phone doesn't go flying. So yeah, that, that's what you're going to get. So I'm pretty sure it's going to fall and do all that stuff. So you just have to kind of live with it. All right. So it is very very muggy and humid. It was nearly 40 with the Humidex today. 38, 40. So everything is just soaking wet. Hopefully my guitar will stay in tune tonight. Uh, usually does pretty good even in this this kind of stuff. But when it's this muggy, that's a test for any guitar. Uh, anybody with a natural finished guitar tonight will be retuning and tuning and retuning and retuning probably after every five minutes <laughs> you know, or after every song or so. So it's still a jam night. I am going to attempt oh, a whole bunch of cats. It's my aunt's cat, the other cat. Um, um, yeah, so it's my, this will be my fourth show uh, jam night. And uh, that's, uh, I'm okay uh, with the jam nights, but I'm going to have to get a gig. So, because the job I have right now, uh, I don't know how much longer, like once I'm done cutting that guy's wood for him, uh, I, I don't know how much more work I'm going to have, right? So, I got to start finding another source of income ASAP. So, I'm going to ask for a gig tonight. Uh, and tonight's video, hopefully you can see me well. Will it be about what it costs to become a professional musician? Uh, you know, equipment, things like that. You know, uh, time invested. How much does it cost to become a professional musician? Well, I can put it to you this way. Not as much as you think. It's not what you buy. It's the quality of what you buy. Because you can buy things new. You can buy things used, obviously. You know, there's no doubt about that. And everybody has a different standard of what they're willing to tolerate on stage and not. Oh, here comes the hydro truck. That's never a good sign. Mind you, we just had a lot of... Oh, he's going up the side road, so there must be power out there. Big trucker. Uh, so, bottom line. Um, if you're in a band, things are going to be different. Uh, here's a typical scenario. Guy has $50 microphone, a, a 10 or 15 watt underpowered PA, uh, and an $8,000 guitar. <laughs> Does that not sound a little bit familiar for most people? Yeah, it is. Why? Because, well, strangely enough, people, you know, especially guitar players, we take a lot of pride in our guitars, and we uh, always like to play the Cadillacs as much as we, whatever we can afford, you know? Uh, you know, if you have three kids, you can sell two, keep one, and buy a good guitar, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's kind of like, that's the mentality of a guitar player musician, uh, is always buy the best you can, right? Uh, you might have a crappy amp, it's probably going to be used, and then what happens is, or the guy has five or ten or twelve guitars but they're all like two hundred dollars three hundred dollar guitars when he could have bought a really good guitar just rolled the windows ever so slightly just so you guys can hear me a bit better i don't want to roll them up too much too muggy uh, but yeah so we don't prioritize very properly when we're getting into this whole music industry thing as a live player as a studio player strangely enough in a studio a lot of times you don't even need to own an instrument because everything's already there. Back over going down the road. Uh, so a lot of times, like even your equipment, you don't end up using your equipment because uh, your equipment's junk in comparison to what's already sitting in the studio. Unless you're paying for the studio time or whatever, but even at that, most studios have their own guitar. They got guitars and keyboards and drums, and, you know, sometimes several different types uh, you know, to uh, get different sounds, whatever. And, and they do this uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, you don't know who's going to be walking into the studio. 
uh, and what type of style of music they're going to play. So it's good to have a plethora of different style guitars or basses or amps or whatever. Uh, cheaper studios usually, you know, it's kind of bring your own instruments and that's it. Uh, but with the more elaborate studios, yeah, they're pretty much fully equipped. So you don't have to really worry about it too much. But a lot of guys like to use their own stuff because they're familiar with it. I understand that. And I definitely respect that because when you're using your own equipment, even if there's something better there, there's just that familiarization that makes you play better. You know, being used to your own instruments, whatever the instrument is. Now, that said, uh, it's kind of like singers. They tend to like to bring their own microphone. Why? Because... They're used to the dynamics of their own microphone. Getting used to a different microphone is something that even myself, like every time I go on to a different jam, like each mic, they do the same thing, but it's just one might be a little, you know, you, especially when you're not in charge of the controls of to, to shape the sound, uh, you might find that the dynamics on one mic is totally different from another, and that dynamic might be enough to throw you off, so that you're not performing 100%, right? So. That's why people like to use their own equipment. But what about playing live? You, you want to go and make a couple of bucks. Well, first off, the first thing I would recommend you do, especially if you're new at it, is a bunch of jam nights. Because here's how it works. Maybe you read about, wrote a bunch of songs yourself. Maybe you're just going to steal everybody else's music like I do. Maybe you throw in the odd original like I do. Uh, I tend to do top 40 stuff, people, stuff that people know. And I'm okay with that. Why? I can live with myself doing that. Why? Most people are expecting to hear familiar tunes anyway. Uh, some places you get away with all original. That's always great. But those places, a lot, a lot of bars or revenues don't really want anybody playing original because they don't want to take the risk that you might be, uh, okay, yeah, that's an original band, but they're like a death metal band and it's like the venue just doesn't really appreciate that kind of music or whatever. So you got to kind of scout your place first. That's where you start. Number one, what kind of equipment are you going to need? Well, where are you playing? Uh, if you're playing in a, a bar and it's easily, a lot of times, like, uh, you'll play a place. I've played places completely unplugged. No, no, uh, no uh, amps, nothing. Ah, sorry, itching ear. Sorry about that. Or two is itching ear scratching. Uh, but, you know, the bar was small enough that just my vocals and guitar was loud enough and, you know, you're playing for 12, maybe 15 people who are still talking, but they don't have to yell over you. And you're close enough that you're loud enough that you don't need to be mic. And that's about as cheap as a gig as you're going to get. Because you don't have to haul anything other than your guitar and yourself. Right? And your beer money. <laughs> you know, your beer money is probably going to be heavier than your guitar. You know what I mean? Um, if you're into that sort of thing. But you get what I'm getting at. Like, that, that's, that's level one. You know, just the, the actual acoustic, acoustic bare bones venue. The problem with that is that's like maybe one out of every thousand places you could pull that off. Because usually what what happens is no matter how loud you sing or your guitar is, uh, the guy three tables down can't hear you. And he can't hear you just because everybody else is talking and it, it's just the sound doesn't travel. So you're going to go pretty hoarse doing that. So now you're starting to consider getting a mic, microphone, that kind of stuff, right? So how big of a play, uh, PA do you need? Uh, my PA is only 15 watts. And you, you divide that into four channels, <laughs> that's like three and a half watts per channel when you crank it out if you have all four instruments plugged in. It's not very loud and I have two speakers. But I could play a small, small venue with that, and, um, whatever. But... Is it you're gonna? You're, you're, it's just not gonna be enough. So the best thing I would recommend when you're getting into it is okay, you have your guitar before you buy your next guitar, or your next bass, or your next drumsticks, or your next whatever it is, drums, whatever it is, or mic. Make sure you got something to play through. Amplifiers, PA's. Put that as a priority. I know it's less glamorous. Everybody always wants that new guitar. And when you have enough money sitting there that afford a, you know, a decent, maybe 400-watt PA system, which is not really big, but good enough to play a lot of smaller places. Most of the really big places have their own PA. Uh, but that, that's what I would hunt out, is places that have their own PA first. Because although you're going to find less of these places, chances are they have a PA for one reason, one reason only. 
they get a lot of live bands. In there. Uh, almost every uh, bar will have its uh, its own uh, you know stereo system. That's fine, but you can't play through the stereo system. You need a PA. So when you see a bar that has a PA system, there's a good op. There, there's probably a good chance that the reason why they have it is because they can get in more live bands. Uh, they, you know, like they're a little bit out of the way. People don't want to lug all that equipment out. Don't worry, man. You come and play here. We got the equipment. All you got to do is show up and maybe bring your own mic and your guitar uh, or whatever instrument you're playing. So that's one thing I would put as a priority is a good PA system. Your instrument. Um, well, the instrument. Here's my take on that. I got a $400 guitar sitting in my back seat here that I've been as AEL 10, which has already paid for itself at least once or twice. Um, and I've had it for a long time. And I know someday something bad's going to happen to that guitar at a jam night. It might get stolen on me, God forbid. Uh, some drunk's probably going to fall on it. It's going to get all scratched up. It's going to get dropped. Uh, the pickup's going to short out again, like it did. Uh, the ne neck's going to end up warped on it from playing in hot, humid bars then taking it out into the cold winter to put it back into a freezing vehicle to take it home. That's what's going to happen to this guitar. I already know this. Why? Because the other three live guitars that I had, that's what happened to them. <laughs> you know? And those weren't cheap guitars either. Those were like, you know, $1,500 guitars. And so when I'm picking my live equipment, I, I don't pick stuff... Uh, for example, with natural finishes. Why? Because natural finish instruments take a beating. That's why, although polyethylene stifles the sound, and I know some people will debate that, oh, the finish makes no difference to the sound, it's only about the wood or whatever. Some people say, ah, oh, the wood doesn't make any difference either. Uh, well, here's my take on that. If you can't hear the difference, don't worry about it. Uh, just, you know, use whatever you can use. What I do look for in a live guitar, though, is how well does it play? That, I think, is the, the paramount for me because a guitar that might not have the best tonal qualities but has okay tonal qualities, played extremely well, will outshine a guitar that sounds phenomenal that you can't keep in tune or keep in tune very well. Uh, and that, that does happen. I, I've seen a many expensive uh, Taylor guitar go out of tune while, halfway through the guy's song. Uh, for example, I'm a huge fan of 12 strings. My next uh, acoustic is going to hopefully be a 12 string, but before I get that 12 string, I'm going to get probably a thousand watt PA system and a bunch of speakers. I'll probably pay the same thing I would for a good 12 string, but the uh, the, the good thing about it is that now I open myself up to, hey, you want somebody to play? Oh, dude, we don't have a PA. We'd love to have you, but don't worry about it. I got everything I need. You just tell me where and when and how much you're going to pay. Me. You know what I mean? Like that. That's that's kind of what you got to go after. You better watch the speed. Um, and that in itself, I, I can be honest with you, is going to not pay itself off as quickly, but it just, it opens up so many more possibilities of places to play. So that when you have your own PA, you might not always have to drag the thing out, which is great, but you might not just be stuck to playing bars. Oh, there's a, a high school prom. Proms pay very well if you can get them. Maybe uh, it's just a, a local dance somewhere or whatever it's going to be. It's just like, okay, people, they'll pool their money together and they want to have uh, a good, uh, you know, just good entertainment, good old-fashioned entertainment. My little town does it all the time. Well, not all the time, but maybe about once every couple of months. They'll hire a band to come in uh, to the hall and just, you know, so people can rock their faces off. They don't do it enough, if you ask me. It'd be nice to have something every month from the town recreation, you know? Uh, and the thing about that is what you end up with, okay, is that now you can offer, and I mean, picture not having to go very far, like only a couple of clicks from home. Well, you can be sleeping in your own bed at the end of the night if, if, if it's a gate. You don't have to travel far. And you can do it maybe once a month or once every two months. And then book alternate gigs around so that what ends up happening is that you got a, yourself a little tour which is what I want to set up within the next six months. I want to have basically a gig to two gigs a week to basically make a living off. But I have to find the places that pay. That's the other problem. Is find, you might find a place that pays, but finding that $600 a night gig or $1,000 a night gig 
those places are really hard to get and it definitely not places I recommend you start at. Why? Because when bars are paying that kind of, or places are paying that kind of money, they expect a certain quality of musician. I'm not saying you have to be the best musician in the world, but they expect the crowd to be not only entertained, but to be pleased with what they heard. It's not a matter of you have to be able to play like Ingve Malmsteen or whatever, or Mozart or or uh, you know the, the hottest band on the on, on the radio right now. It's not that at all. It's that people need to be entertained. You're an entertainer first when you go on stage. You're a musician second. When you're in your room, you're a musician first. Get all your stuff down. Then you're an entertainer second. You know. So you got to learn when, when, how to do your job properly, and you got to know your job. When you go on stage, you got to say, I know my job. You know, you can't be going on stage super nervous and super... Yeah, you get excited. Sometimes you get a little bit nervous. But if you're one of those people that you were nervous from the first song to the last song, then you need to do a couple more jam nights. Uh, you need to, you know, dust out those cobwebs. And that, that'll even get experienced musicians at some time. I mean, some musicians that are used to playing in front of locals have no fear on stage. But as soon as you're in front of total strangers... Um, it becomes new and then you're nervous, right? And then when you're nervous, you don't play as well, sometimes. And I've seen some people that they're so nervous that they they just cannot even remember their lyrics. Uh, something that you might need to invest in is maybe a little inkjet printer or uh, what I saw, a guy that was playing uh, in front of my, basically, he had literally a gig in front of the house, but he was getting paid. But basically it was our annual fish fry. And him and a bunch of other guys that jammed together all the time ended up coming up, and I ended up jamming with them. It was really cool. Uh, but he had his, uh, 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 we call it a, not an iPad, but a tablet. And it scrolled the song, so basically had a teleprompter there as he was playing. I'm like, that would be fantastic. You would never forget a lyric, or if you lost your place, you could always find, you know, where to jump in. And that happens. That happens. I mean, you're trying to remember anywhere from 30 to 45 to 60 songs in one night, um, you're going to forget something. You're going to screw up a line somewhere. And sometimes when you screw up a line just a little bit, it throws you off for the next line. It's, ah, what, what, where was I at, you know? And you, you end up repeating yourself or whatever. If you, if you don't draw attention to it, people don't notice. Like when you break a string, if you don't draw attention to it, people don't notice. Unless you got yourself a Floyd Rose guitar that goes completely out of tune when you're playing, which I'm telling you that from experience. People tend to no notice that. That's why when you see guys that have been playing live for years, even guys like uh, Paul Gilbert, for example, you know, definitely a guy who is, uh, you know, Floyd Rose savvy, we'll just say. But even a guy like him has ditched, ditched uh, Floyd Rose's because when they break a string line, the guitar goes out of tune. And you can't, and he's the only guitar player on stage. You kind of notice if he, he, you just can't finish the song when it's that far out of tune. Sometimes you can one note it to the end, but and uh, but people notice. They, they'll notice. But a fixed bridge, you don't notice. Uh, but let's talk about the cost. Okay. On the cheap, the cheapest I've ever performed live. Equipment-wise, was an Oscar Schmitz 12-string guitar that was under 250 bucks, brand new, brand spanking new. Okay, 250 bucks. The microphone and the stand at the time, and uh, your uh, your typical SM58, sure SM58, uh, I think was another 250 bucks. That was 500 dollars. That's because I decided to go new. That said. A guitar I once fixed up, I could have performed live with. I never did my $6 guitar. If you follow this channel or my other channel long enough, you'll know about the $6 guitar from a few years back. I bought, I sold it for 20 bucks actually. But I could have literally uh, performed with that guitar. It wouldn't have been a stellar sounding guitar, but it would have got the job done. And it would have impressed people enough. Definitely not for the tonal qualities. Definitely not for the um, uh, stellar playability of it, but I would. I, I did have a whole s uh, set list which I would practice with just that guitar from time to time, just to see if I could pull it off. And yeah, I would have been able to. 
I do regret not ever playing that guitar live because maybe I did once. I don't know. This is again. I, I don't know. How, I can't even remember how long I had that guitar for. But the reason why it was a six dollar guitar was I found the guitar on the side of the road with the top smashed in, and I glued it back together, got it playing again, and the strings were six bucks. Hence the six dollar guitar. And I may have brought it out. One, I come to think, but I may have brought it out for one jam night just to tell the story of it. I was going to bring out one of my violins tonight to tell a story, but not not in this kind of humidity. Uh, those instruments are a little bit too delicate for that, in my taste. Uh, I, I definitely don't want anything bad to happen to those instruments. Um, so, yeah, you could start in pretty cheap, but you're not going to have much. You're probably not going to be happy with what you have. What about going the used route? Okay, I don't buy too many used guitars. I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't think I've ever bought a used guitar. I don't think I've ever bought one used. Or did I? No, I don't think I did. I've uh, had guitars donated to me that were fixer-uppers. Yeah, I've done a lot of those. Frankensteins. Yeah, I, I built a lot of those. Mainly electrics. Uh, a lot of curbside guitar rescues. Uh, yeah, I've done a lot of those. But no, I, I've never bought a used guitar in my life. I never felt the need to. Uh, although... There are some, oh, sorry I am lying, my SG-61 reissue was a used guitar. But I bought it from uh, Long & McQuaid Music, so it's kind of like, like buying a new guitar, uh, but it was, it, was a, it was a used one. Uh, that, so that's probably the only used guitar I've ever owned, or, or bought, sorry, not owned, but bought. Uh, but that was an expensive guitar, even used. I mean, it was still a $1,600 guitar used. Back when I got it, it was two years old, right, when I bought it. So, the thing is, is do you need that kind of a guitar on stage? Well, if you're making money every night with it, or every other night, or every week, yeah, you, you might be willing to risk a guitar like that. I'm not willing to, willing to risk my SG-61 or my SG-3 on stage, unless it's a place that I'm really comfortable playing. I do it once in a while, but to play uh, four nights a week with it, I just couldn't sacrifice that guitar because I know what happened to my uh, beautiful Hammer, Hammer Diablo that I played four nights a week with uh, for a couple of years straight. Uh, yeah, like we're talking over 200 shows with that guitar. 200 some odd shows. That's a lot for an amateur guitar player to be playing. And yeah, I've told the story about the Hammer Diablo, what happened to it. Uh, but yeah, it got beat up like you wouldn't believe. You know, um, it really did. So, now I got that Jackson Flying V for 400 bucks. But I had a really cool guitar, was a, an Epiphone G400. That thing I bought as a jam night guitar. And I think that thing with the amp, 15 watt amp, little crate VT15, VTR15. Excellent little amp. So much volume for such a small little amp. I couldn't believe it. And the tone out of it was just... It was still for, great for little bars and stuff like that. And that thing, I played all over the place. I mean, I, I pretty much fried out the electronics on that amp. It's still going. It's still going. But the guitar, the amp, 200, uh, 400 bucks with the taxes and a gig bag. So I think it was like 300 or, or 280 or something like that, or 260 for the G400. Now, mind you, this is over a decade ago when G400s were well under $400. But that guitar um, was a jam night guitar. It was bulletproof. You just, it stayed in tune so well. It had the polyethylene finish. It sounded okay. But after a while, the uh, tone pots and everything started to short out on it. Uh, but the thing is, is that had I had found a band, that guitar would have paid itself off in maybe a couple of nights of playing. So in other words, it's a guitar you don't care what really bad happens to. And it sounded good enough. Did it sound as good as my Gibson? No. But did I get standing ovations on stage playing it? What I did really well? Absolutely. And it was a cheap guitar. Did it sound good enough? Yeah. Uh, especially jamming with some really good musicians? Yeah, it sounded fantastic. What about my Epiphone G1275 uh, double neck? That thing was an absolute showstopper live, and it was a pretty reliable guitar. It's just it weighed 14 pounds, so taking it, uh, bringing it everywhere was like hauling a refrigerator around. But boy, I tell you, man, 
if you get a double neck guitar like that and you're going to play live with it, invest in some sunglasses because the amount of photos that are going to be taken of you, it's just people freak out when they see a double neck guitar on stage. It's something you have to experience it to understand it. Uh, I understand why Jimmy Page had such a cumbersome uh, double neck on stage. And uh, the Jimmy Sambora double neck ovation. That thing is just, it just blows people's mind because it's so unusual to see. And people just enjoy it. They just tend to really hone in on it. But it was a $1,200 machine at the end of the day. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, I could see myself doing gigs with it and stuff like that. But it was like, once again, do I want to sacrifice that thing beating it up in bars? So the question is, are you going to compromise on tone, is what I'm really saying. Uh, and what makes a good jam like guitar? Well, I've talked about them before. Something that really holds tuning well and plays well is going to take priority over everything. Because when you have a guitar that holds tuning well, your song sounds good the whole way through. Uh, especially if you're doing solos or whatever, string bends, whatever. You might not be doing that so much on acoustic. But there's nothing worse than, and I've had that with the Oscar Smiths because it, was, it had a, a natural finish. That thing, being a 12-string, it stayed in pretty good tune for a 12-string, but you really had to stretch those strings to, to keep that in tune. And I played with it live a few times. Uh, and everybody loved the sound of it because even the cheapest of 12 strings still with that natural coursing sound you get with the uh, octave pitch on each string of uh, each string being doubled up well it, it basically in a nutshell uh, just uh, it, it, it just it just it, people love the sound of it it just it just naturally sounds good even if the tonal qualities aren't the best Sorry about my camera view, but uh, I'm driving right now, so I can't do anything about that. i got to get a cell phone holder on the, <laughs> that you guys can see me. I, I, I just haven't had a chance to set it up yet. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow for next week. Um, but you get what I'm getting at, that you don't need much. For 500 bucks, you can get into it very easily. If you find a $100 guitar used and a used mic, and mic stand, you could probably get away with that. But, like the $20... Uh, dollar store microphone or whatever, $10 microphone, you, you can't perform with that. You can't put any volume to those things. You need a proper stage mic, but you can buy sometimes, you can get a used mic for like 50 bucks. Maybe somebody will give you one. It's like, okay, this thing's all beat up, and uh, it's an older first gen SM58. Okay, the thing at a certain volume is just going to squeal back on you. Maybe you get like a third or fourth gen like I got, which uh, has the ceramic... Uh, ceramics in it so that it doesn't squeal back as much uh, and feed back on you that you can put a little bit of volume to it maybe get one of those uh, and those uh, yeah they do do well um, I've performed live with my SM58 a few times is it the best mic out there no but it's a it's a omnidirectional mic it does the job it sounds good enough um, yeah so the real one for me the, the only thing I need to complete my rig to get the show going is buying a better PA now, what can you do for, say, 1000 to 1500 bucks? You can do a lot for 1000 to 1500 bucks. Uh, rental equipment stores oftentimes will get rid of old, say, a set of JBLs for a couple hundred bucks. That would be normally, you know, uh, three grand new. It's just, it's you know, they've made their money, so they just want a new turnover uh, of newer equipment. They'll sell you the old stuff for really good deals. Uh, you get all the cables with it and everything. Uh, same with PAs, but used rental equipment. The problem with rental equipment is there's a reason why it's cheap. Because, you know, it's usually the stuff that, okay, it's starting to go. Uh, the last three guys that rented it said this thing keeps popping when I'm, when I'm using it. Then you got your, what you call, uh, out of commission musicians. I don't have time for it anymore. I, I need to clear out the garage. I just don't need it. Uh, here, 500 bucks, you get... Uh, Three, uh, two giant JBLs and a, a subwoofer and a monitor um, and, 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 a, and a powered PA system and three mic stands whatever, for 500 bucks. Sometimes you get stuff like that and it'll get the job done for you long enough until you can afford something better. I say if you've got the money for new, go for new, but you're going to get less for new a lot of times, but not all the time. Sometimes 
again, you have to do your research. The same way you would research where the bar you're going to play, you know, does this place uh, pay people? Do they pay well? Do they not pay well? Are they known for skipping out on people? Um, is this a crowd I can actually appease uh, with the style of music I play? You're going to do all that research first, right? Where to play and how to play and what you're going to play. Then, when it comes to the actual equipment, you know, will it do... You always want a, a one or two sizes up from what you need. But you can walk into most bars and see that the average bar size and what the average equipment they're using. Uh, so you go into a place that has live bands all the time. Uh, they're probably going to have equipment that's more than what they need. Why? Because they probably already bought the two cheap PA systems before they settled on the good one. Oh, that was a cool bike. Big old chopper. Um, meaning they bought a four, uh, you know, uh, you know, a hundred watt system, and that hundred watt system was like it, it just, you know, it's always at the max, and the it just, you know, it just sounds horrible, right? So then they go up to like the five, four hundred watt system, which sort of does it, but they need a little bit more, and it's still you're over pushing the system. Then they buy the fifteen hundred, two thousand, ten thousand watt system. They spent a little bit more, but if they would have just bought it in the first place, they would have spent the same. And, you know, they would have actually saved money by buying a little bit more. Uh, but usually that comes on the heels of them actually dealing with sound men saying, well, you don't have to go out and buy a $10,000 system. You can get away with a $1,500 system in this venue because, or maybe, you know, okay, well, no, no, you're going to need at least, uh, say, 1,000 watts or maybe 1,200. 2,000 watts will do it. You don't need 10,000 watts. That's overkill. Um, that type of thing. Or maybe, okay, no, your PA is fine. You need more monitors or whatever it's going to be. And maybe just another power amp. And a lot of places do that. It's like, okay, well, we have a 50-watt PA, but with a 4,000-watt power amp that runs all the monitors, whatever it's going to be. So, yeah, there's a whole bunch of, but then that's a bulkier system. But if it doesn't have to go anywhere, who cares? And sometimes you can get these old power monitors or power, uh, power supplies for, like, hundred bucks you know because it's old equipment thing weighs like you know 125 pounds you're, you're only going to roll it out onto the floor once a week or it stays in you know a permanent home you know behind the bar or wherever it's going to be wherever the sound man delegates it from uh but if you have to tow the stuff around i mean a lot of gigging musicians the big thing with them now is powered monitors oh they're so slick it doesn't work for with full bands as much because you need a multi... Uh, sometimes what guys will do is they'll have the powered monitor and then a, a mixer. You know, so then they can have like eight mics on there or drum, you know, mic the drums, whatever it is. And that's fine, but then you got to tote all this equipment. You have to find plugins everywhere for it. Whereas a powered monitor, it's one plug. Now, if you're, uh, you know, uh, maybe two or less acoustic uh, duo or, you know, just a, you know, a single player... Uh, a powered monitor might be the way to go in two subwoofer or two uh, monitors, and you have one floor monitor. You got sound coming back at you right at your face, so you don't have. You, so your stage volume you can adjust very easily, and then just put the power out into the audience, the, the volume out to the audience, and everything sounds good. If you can get get away with five speakers, you can corner a room pretty good with that, and still have a stage monitor uh, that uh, does everything you're going to need. And some, right? So these are just things that you're gonna learn when you go and you play on other people's system, what works, what doesn't. Because a lot of times people buy stuff they either don't need or they buy stuff that isn't adequate. But the price is gonna vary, but I'd say if you can if you're thinking about touring around, uh, research anything you're gonna buy, but sometimes if you're buying used, it's whatever you find, right? It just for the right price. Um, Buying used electronics is always a gamble. Speakers, I don't mind buying used speakers because a speaker, if it's blown, you're going to know right away. If it's ripped, you're going to know right away. You're going to hear it, right? If you hear buzzing coming out of that speaker at low volume, you know that, you know that speaker's ripped. Maybe you get a good deal on it, but who wants to listen to the, a buzzing speaker all night? Maybe back in 1969, that might have been cool to get a fuzz-sounding fuzz amp, but it was no good for vocals or anything like that. Um... Yeah, so what, what then you're looking at is a situation where, again, the more you know, the less you're going to need. So for me, my ideal setup as a uh, single, you know, solo act 
is a powered monitor because you have a speaker built in there, and that's your basically uh, power amp coming back to you. So you got both your your uh, mic, uh, maybe you got four ports, two mics, two instruments. Okay, you don't need a phenomenal amount of EQ there, enough to get the job done. And then uh, four speakers, two uh, speakers to put at the back of the room with stands that's up above the crowd coming back at you and then two on the stage going out into the audience. That way you have sound bouncing off of every wall, uh, filling in the corners of the, of the room as, as best as it can. And that um, will give you all you need and probably have much less than you think. So that's just some of the things I would look for. And other things too is, when you're playing all these other places that have their own equipment, uh, with the exception of maybe the guitar and the mic, a lot of times too is you can keep it cheap and the money you make from that you can put towards better equipment. And then once you get everything you, you got, you've got a good uh, circuit of uh, bars that you're going to play. Right now I don't have a circuit set up. Uh, I'm going to get my first gig and then I'm going to start working on the circuit. Where Where's the next bar I want to play? I don't know because they're getting the bars that I want to play are getting further up, but the bar that I really want to end my circuit on pays incredibly well. Uh, it's the Heart and Crown in Ottawa. And they can pay, if you're playing in the front stage, you can make anywhere from 600 to 1800 a night. Problem is, is you might only get playing there, if you're good, maybe once a year. If you're really good, maybe twice a year. Maybe twice a year. If you're phenomenal, maybe you get um, uh, four times a year. So those type of gigs are not easy to get. And you got to travel a little bit for them, and it's got to be a place that'll put you up for the night. If you got to drive four hours home or four hours to get to your gig, uh, you better be spending the day and the night there. And you might you might want to make it a three night week so that you make enough money to cover the, the expense of going there. The other thing you're going to need is transportation to get stuff around. Now, for those of my friends that live in the city, uh, I would invest in a gig bag over a guitar case any day. Why? Because it keeps your hands free to carry a mic stand and or bag or whatever, or an amp, uh, and try to play places that have their own PA. Gig bag, yes, it's it's not, uh, you get hard shell gig bags, but a gig bag is always easy. It's just, it's not the best protection. It's always a compromise. Uh, now let's say you start really gigging a lot and your equipment, it got the job done, it owes you nothing, or maybe it doesn't owe you nothing, but you're ready for an upgrade. What do you upgrade first? Well, like I say, if you want to play bigger venues, then your priority is to your PA. If you're happy with the venues you're playing, uh, or uh, able to play, like maybe like there's some guys I know, they have PAs like, dude, don't worry about the PA, man, man. we got to keep turning that thing down. It'll just drown everybody out. It's, it's so loud, it's so powerful. we got like, you know, 4,000 watts. We're good. And we got like 20 speakers hooked up to it. We're good. Don't worry about that. So then they could just focus on their instruments, uh, new cables, all kinds of stuff like that. For me, I'm always looking for the simplest possible rig. Why tear down, put up, tear down is always quicker. Um, for example, like one of my old drummers, Scott. I miss the guy. I love the guy. I haven't, I haven't seen him in years. It'd be nice to catch up with him and jam with him for old time's sake. Scott was a pretty cool cat on the drums. Very Tommy Lee-ish. Uh, and his, his two favorite drummers were Tommy Lee and Neil Burke. Right? Although we never played a lot of Rush, strangely enough. But he was obsessed with Neil Peart's kit, like most drummers would be. Why? Because it's just pure eye candy, right? So before you know it, he's got a drum, drum riser, double bass, uh, triple kick pedal, uh, 18 or 19 cymbals, uh, four floor toms, uh, five cowbells, two hi-hats, uh, two snares, uh, didn't bring it all out every time, uh, the drum riser, and this was a good 45 minutes just getting this shit into the bar. It was another 45 minutes setting it up, and we had it down to a science how to set it up quickly, because the first time we played, it took us an hour and a half to set it up, so okay, we, we got to move this thing in sections. And it was just, it was the full truckload. We needed two vehicles to haul the equipment. And then a car to haul the people. <laughs> You know, so a gig that paid 600 a night for three or four guys, depending on what band we were in at the time. Uh, you know, it was you know we were spending like 80, 100 bucks in gas even back in the 90s, right? So it's like okay, well, next thing I know, he's starting to look like the drummer from uh, Extreme, five-piece kit, 
I like those jazz guys. They do more with less now, you know what I mean? Because, okay, I'll bring the double pedal. That's good enough, you know what I mean? Uh, and, you know, one floor tom, a crash, a ride, maybe two upper toms, that's it, and a cowbell, you know what I mean? And a splash, maybe. Uh, everything can be moved in and out within 15 minutes. The drums can be set up within uh, 15, the sound check. The whole guitars, drums, everything, sound check under half an hour. Great. Fantastic. Uh, the single setup I got, you can sound check another fi under five minutes. Now, you see what I mean about convenience and stuff? It really does make a huge difference to, uh, to the player when you don't have to uh, waste a lot of time setting things up. Uh, but what's going to happen, like years ago, I used to have foot pedals. And foot pedals took me forever to set up, even when I'd come in with my pedal board. I'd always have to be hooking up this adapter, that adapter, check this battery, that battery, whatever, connect this, connect that. I had something like, uh, in guitar pedals, I still love guitar pedals, they were cool. But then I had something like 12 or 15 guitar pedals. So you tell me how much equipment that is to haul. And if you have to start hooking up all these power supplies and stuff like that to plug this crap in, wow. Everybody's fighting over a plug, right? Oh, there's not enough plug. Okay, Reg, you got to put your batteries in, the uh, batteries in. And you're always short on batteries. Ah, there's a red S SRV went by. Nice. Uh, that's what I got here. Or CRV, sorry. Um, I must be thinking of Steve, uh, Steve Ray Vaughan. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but anyway, uh, long story short, what I'm looking at is I went to a rack system. Why? Because it was one big pedal board. And, uh, my amp, my amp, my Mesa Boogie half cap, uh, my Randall head, and I needed uh, two plugins instead of uh, 12. You know, and I didn't have to carry a whole bunch of batteries. And I didn't need, you know, all these patch cables and stuff like that. And that really cut down a lot of time. The problem is my rack system I had, I had a GFX 7. Sounded great, it had the twin tubes little uh, AX-12 7s in there. It sounded awesome when it worked, but that thing malfunctioned on stage on me so many times that I ended up getting so fed up with rack effects, I got as fed up with rack effects as I did with whammy bars, that every time I went into a bar, that amazing sound I programmed in my rack effect, I'd have to reprogram because the EQ didn't fit the bar. And you just couldn't hear the guitar no matter how loud, you, it just turned into mud. No matter how loud you cranked it, it's just the EQ were not for that room. So I ended up going back to a, a basic amp anyway. And then the amp well, it was one plug-in. I don't know what that was. But anyway, uh, it was just one plug-in, right? So it was nice to have that simplicity. It really was. Um, maybe I'd bring out a wah, wah pedal once in a while. Maybe I'd bring out this, that, the other thing once in a while. But most of the time, it was I had three guitars. Uh, we were a metal band, so I never brought acoustics. Uh, but, yeah, three guitars, and there was only one night out of the probably 250-some-odd shows that I ever played live with, that, you know, with different bands that I ever broke two guitar strings on two different guitars, or a guitar string on two different guitars in the same night that required me three guitars. So I started risking it and going down to two guitars. That's great. I just bring another set of strings, <laughs> you know, and that, 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 so I started doing that. Because sometimes you can just overpack the equipment, you know what I mean? So, to avoid this, uh, again, you, you'll, as you get to know your stuff, I mean, things can happen on stage, string breakages happen, uh, you always pray it doesn't happen, but it happens, it happens. Uh, this is where, again, understanding musical theory can really help you out, especially if you have a fixed bridge guitar, because when the solo goes this way and you break a string, it now goes the other way. You play it the other way. Uh, why? Simple. It's, uh, you have to adapt, right? On the spot, improvise. Um, yeah, so at the end of the day, I can only say that, um, yeah, simplifying your equipment not only becomes cheaper, uh, and again, a lot of times you can get, you know, most of what you need for less than a grand anyway, uh, adequately, but, you know, the, like the saying goes, always buy the best equipment you can afford. I think, I think that just kind of goes without saying, right? I think that's just kind of common sense. 
buy the best that you can get. Now, best does not necessarily dictate price. Uh, for example, a high quality uh, instrument might only be a couple of hundred bucks. If it gets the job done and done reliably and, and, and is the tool to the job, the thing that you look at, like this G4, uh, the Ibanez AEL 10 or that G400, it not only got the job done, but it surpassed its requirements, <laughs> so to speak, of what I needed out of it. And that, in itself, is is uh, pretty uh, pretty good. You know, that, that's pretty good because very rarely you get that, but then it's like, okay, that's why you want to play smarter, not, not you know, necessarily, not harder, but just... You don't want to be spending money on stuff that doesn't do the job. I mean, everybody knows the guy who has 27 guitars and he plays three that actually... He bought 27 really cheap guitars. And, uh, you know, uh, the money he wasted on all those guitars, he could have phenomenal equipment. And I know what a, every musician is the same. Once they get something that works really well, they hang on to it for years because it works. And it becomes hard to replace that. Like this Ivan has AEL 10. Although it's not the best sounding guitar, it's going to be a very tough guitar to replace for a live guitar because it's just it's the, it's just such a great jack of all trades of what it, it, it does for me. It sounds good enough. The sound can be shaped for a lot of different tones. It's stable. It's reliable. Um, yeah, it records okay. Um, it just kind of does everything well. Now that said, would I rather be playing on stage with a, the, the uh, Richie Sambora double neck guitar? Yeah, but that's a $2,700 guitar before taxes. Um, and I know it would be worth it if I was getting paid, you know, 100 bucks a night to uh, 600 bucks a night. Yeah, it would pay for itself in a relatively reasonable amount of time. So when it did go on you, you wouldn't be so distraught. Uh, Nuno Betancourt, uh, his N1 and N2 guitars are completely, completely worn out. And he's so infatuated and loved these guitars so much that he basically just can't part with them. And he loves playing them so much. Uh, he's had guitar luthers rebuild the fretboards, rebuild, refret it, do it so much. And it's getting to the point where he says, it's just, you know, it, he's going to have to retire these guitars. And he hates the idea, the thought of it because there's just, it's just, these guitars, you know, that's what happens to a live guitar. Uh, you do get attached to it because it does the job you want, but it also becomes a guitar that gets, you know, its it, its fate is going to be worn out. Um, I mean, Robert Johnson played that same guitar for decades, <laughs> so to speak, not because he just loved the guitar, it's because he was too poor to buy another one, you know what I mean? Uh, those type of guys, oh, that's a big pothole. Oh. This is actually the first time I'm getting here kind of in the daylight. I'm getting here a little bit early because uh, um, I want to, uh, I gotta go get some uh, birthday gifts. So, yeah. Oh, there's another little bar there. That's cool. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. As I was saying, uh, picking your equipment, no, you don't have to spend, you don't have to break the bank. And sometimes you can get donated equipment too. Uh, especially when you start to know other musicians and stuff like that. But the easiest thing I would say is use what you got at first, then find out what you need next before you start throwing all kinds of cash and stuff. Because chances are, like I say, you're going to buy the $2,700 guitar and you're going to find out very, very quickly that $2,700 guitars out at a jam night uh, is a really bad idea for those guitars over time. Some people are willing to make that fa sacrifice. Um, but again, I, 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 I always use Taylor guitars and stuff like that or um, whatever as uh, examples because these guitars, they are very, very expensive. Uh, it's been a yield to right away here. Um, yeah, so it's very, very, uh, it's very, um, you know, uh, great to play a nice guitar but you really want to save those for the the the, uh, the nights that pay really well or a place that you know is stable to play in like it's like okay this place is never overly hot in here uh, this place uh, whatever and again I'm not saying you can never play with these guitars live oh no I don't think this place is open now uh, side of the road oh yeah I'm 
or is it open? I hope it's open. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think it's open. I gotta go get a, a couple of birthday gifts. All good, so no problem there. Just gotta find a parking spot. But anyway, I, I'm gonna, I guess I'll wrap it up at that. And there we go. I'll park as far from the stores as humanly possibly can. I don't know why, but I will. Sure, turn off my lights. windows all right hopefully this thing is still rolling but there we go